Goblin Market by Christina Rossetti. A story of sisterhood and addiction. My older sister was kind of like my idol. I wanted everything that she had. I wanted to like everything that she liked. If I had an opinion of something that she didn't share, I would change my opinion immediately so that it would go with hers. And I just thought she was the coolest person in the world. There's a really wonderful photo of us that I love. Do you remember those old micro scooters? We used to ride them around London all the time. And so, like, I thought I was really cool and skilled at it. I would put my leg over the handlebar and sort of cruise, cruise along. And there's a photo of my sister with her, much smaller, obviously, than me at that age, the the scooter angled, trying to get her other leg onto the handlebar to copy me. And it's just so sweet because she obviously would just physically wouldn't be able to do <laughs> to do the same thing. And I just find I just find that the sweetest photo. I love it so much. That is the perfect kind of visual of my goals every single day. I just wanted to be like my sister. Once we both had uh, our own mobile phones, we were basically in touch every evening as well. So yeah, every day, basically. Only because I've always been very protective and B, I've always been quite reserved. I never really spoke up when I had a problem as a child and a teenager. So I would listen to her problems more. And she, I, I think that she would be very open with me. I'm Amy and I live in Cardiff and I'm currently 31 years old. My sister is Karis. She is, or was I should say, only 12 months older than me, 13 months in total. So my birthday's May, she was April. So we were always brought up as a twosome, always known as the girls rather than individuals. We sort of had this almost telepathy where I could understand without words what she wanted. And that's not to say that we didn't bicker, because we did, especially as teenagers. But we were brought up as one, and that's just how we stayed. I haven't really shared. I can't think of a single person that I've I've shared her illness with since she passed and and there are many people who don't know what I went they know they of course know that my sister passed away but they don't know the reason and and I think that people say you know it's so awful that you lost your sister so young and it is awful but the what is equally awful is what led up to that that we had to watch her you know fade over a period of seven to eight years through alcohol Morning and evening, maids heard the goblins cry. Come by our orchard fruits. Come by, come by, come by our orchard fruits. Come by, come by. and quinces, lemons and oranges, plump unpecked cherries, melons and raspberries, bloom down cheeks, peaches, swat headed mulberries, wild free bon cranberries, crab apples, dewberries, pineapples, blackberries, apricots, strawberries, all right together in summer weather, morns that pass by. Fairies that fly, come by, come by, come by, come by. A great fresh from the vine, the ground is full of fine. Dates and sharp bullets, red hairs and green gauges, tamsons and bilberries, taste them and try. Carrots and gooseberries, ripe fine like barberries. To fill your mouth, citrus from the south, sweet to tongue and sound to eye. Come by, come by, come by, come by, come by, come by,
Evening by evening, among the brookside rushes, Laura bowed her head to hear. Lizzie veiled her blushes. Crouching close together in the cooling weather, with clasping arms and cautioning lips, with tingling cheeks and fingertips. Lie close, Laura said, pricking up her golden head. We must not look at goblin men. We must not buy their fruits. Who knows upon what soil they fed their hungry, thirsty roots. Call the goblins, hobbling down the glen, cried Lizzie. Laura, Laura, you should not peep at goblin men. Lizzie covered up her eyes, covered close lest they should look. Laura reared her glossy head and whispered like the restless brook. Look, Lizzie, look, Lizzie. Down the glen tramp little men. One holds a basket, one bears a plate. One loves a golden dish of many pounds weight. How fair the vine must grow whose grapes are so luscious. How warm the wind must blow through those fruit bushes. She went through a relationship breakdown, as many people do in their early 20s, and that seemed to be the trigger. She just, I suppose, used alcohol as a way to get through the immediate period and she never seemed to be able to come back from that. I was in my first year of university, um, and I was away for university. So for me, it was probably more apparent than to others, because I was coming home and seeing a difference in her, and knowing quite readily, being able to, to notice that she was drunk during the daytime, and thinking, when was the last time that she didn't seem that way? She came to stay with me at university and I'd driven home to collect her and driven back with her. And we'd had just an evening in. And then the next morning we woke up and I said to her, shall we go shopping? I remember her saying, will you do my makeup? And I said, yes, I'll do your makeup. And we were going to go shopping. And I said, I'm just going to have a shower and then we'll get dressed and we'll go. I left her in my bedroom. The bathroom was downstairs. I went to have a shower. I must have only been 15, 20 minutes. And I came out of the shower and a housemate said to me, your sister's just popped out. She said she's going to the shop. And the hold was so strong. The need to have a drink was that intense that she just walked out of the house. And that must have upset and I don't like to think about that, but that must have upset her to think that we had those plans and we were going to go shopping, but she couldn't do that. What she had to do was to have a drink and she didn't have a choice. And it always goes back to choice. She didn't have, that wasn't a choice she made. It wasn't shopping or drink. It was drink had to happen and she would do whatever she had to do to get that. And, and that meant wandering off in a city she'd never been to before and leaving me worried and, and concerned, but that she had to. No, said Lizzie. No, no, no. Their offers should not charm us. Their evil gifts would harm us. She thrust a dimpled finger in each ear, shut eyes and ran. <laughs> Curious Laura chose to linger, wondering at each merchant man. One had a cat's face, one whisked a tail, one tramped at a rat's pace, one crawled like a snail. One like a wombat, prowled, obtuse and furry. One like a rattle, tumbled, hurry-scurry. She heard a voice, like voice of doves, cooing all together. They sounded kind and full of loves in the pleasant weather. Laura stretched her gleaming neck, like a rush-embedded swan, like a lily from the beck like a moonlit poplar branch, like a vessel at the launch when its last restraint has gone. Backwards up the mossy glen turned and trooped the goblin men with their shrill, repeated cry, Come by, come by. When they reached where Laura was, they stood stock still upon the moss leering at each other, brother with queer brother, signalling each other, brother with sly brother. One set his basket down, one reared his plate, one began to weave a crown of tendrils, leaves and rough nuts brown. Men sell not such in any town. 
One heaved the golden weight of dish and fruit to offer her. Come by, come by, was still their cry. Nora stared, but did not stir. Longed, but had no money. The whisk-tailed merchant bade her taste in tones as smooth as honey. The cat-face purred, the rat-faced spoke a word of welcome, and the snail-paced even was heard. One parrot-voiced and jolly cried, Pretty goblin? Still for pretty Polly. One whistled like a bird. But Sweet Tooth Laura spoke in haste. Good folk, I have no coin to take what to purloin. I have no copper in my purse, I have no silver either, and all my gold is on the furs that shakes in windy weather above the rusty heather. You have much gold upon your head, they answered all together. Buy from us with a golden curl. She clipped a precious golden lock. She dropped a tear more rare than pearl. Then sucked their fruit globes, fair or red, sweeter than honey from the rock. Stronger than man rejoicing wine. Clearer than water flowed that juice. She never tasted such before. How should it cloy with length of use? She sucked and sucked and sucked the more fruits which that unknown orchard bore. She sucked until her lips were sore. Then flung the emptied rinds away, but gathered up one kernel stone. And knew not was it night or day as she turned home alone. It was just very sudden, the change. I remember the first time that I used anything that wasn't cigarettes or marijuana or anything like that. It was on the outskirts of London at some illegal rave. And the second I walked in, someone offered me something. And it was just, at first, it was very social and it seemed recreational. But the people that I was with... We were doing it every day, so I didn't really think much of it. Those people became, felt like threats to me very quickly of, I want to do more of this, but they seem to, you know, be happy to stop, and I don't want to stop. And so I was quick to drop a lot of people and to prioritise isolation and being by myself because if no one knew or if no one was a part of it then no one could get in the way and the people that I obviously had to push away the most were the people closest to me. I felt like there was not room for my sister. There wasn't room for anyone. I think on a daily basis I would try every platform to see what would induce a message and usually it was snapchat that's the only place where i would get a message back for a long time and then as there would also be those intense moments of a call every night because there was a crisis of some sort but i in a way i was craving for those intense phone calls because at least i knew she was okay because there wasn't the silence and and it made me feel like i was helping even though a lot of the time it was just sort of throwing ropes out into the void. No one's really catching them. I I think I was just overwhelmed by fear that if I wasn't constantly on this mission, then my sister would, would fade away. Lizzie met her at the gate, full of wise upbraidings. Dear, you should not stay so late. Twilight is not good for maidens. Should not loiter in the glen in the haunts of goblin men. Do you not remember Jeanie? How she met them in the moonlight. Took their gifts, both choice and many. Ate their fruits and wore their flowers, plucked from bowers, where summer ripens at all hours. But ever in the noonlight, she pined and pined away. Sought them by night and day, found them no more. But dwindled and grew grey then fell with the first snow, while to this day no grass will grow where she lies low. I planted daisies there a year ago that never blow. You should not loiter so. Nay, hush, said Laura. Nay, hush, my sister. I ate and ate my fill, yet my mouth waters still. Tomorrow night I will buy more. And kissed her. Have done with sorrow. I'll bring you plums tomorrow. 
fresh on their mother twigs, cherries worth getting. You cannot think what figs my teeth have met in, what melons icy cold piled on a dish of gold too huge for me to hold, what peaches with a velvet nap, pellucid grapes without one seed. Odorous indeed must be the mead whereon they grow, and pure the wave they drink with lilies at the brink and sugar sweet their sap. She drank vodka. She would drink some days a full litre, if not more. She had an accident and I remember a paramedic asking what medication she was taking and asking me what she drank. And I, I remember it clearly telling her that she drank at least a litre of vodka because the bottle was full when I left her hours earlier. And I remember the shock on that person's face. And what played into that was she she could see Karis. Karis was in front of her. Karis was a young girl. She was in her 20s. She had long blonde hair, big blue eyes. She was a tiny little thing. She wasn't what society says is an alcoholic, but she was. My social life became almost non-existent. It was just being in a, a mindset of... I have to do all I, I have to do to try and help her, whether I can, and sadly I couldn't. I still had to do what I could. I had a relationship with Karis where she trusted me completely. She listened to me and to be pleading with someone and be explaining time and time again and knowing that anything you say won't make a difference because that person has no choice. And if she had a choice... And I'd have told her, the decision you've made is the wrong one, you need to change and you need to stop. She would have taken that. I'm, I'm 100% sure she would have taken that choice. She would have listened to me. If, and if only, you know, if only loving them harder would, would change things. Golden head, thy golden head, like two pigeons in one nest, folded in each other's wings. They lay down in their curtained bed blossoms on one stem, like two flakes of new-fallen snow, like two wands of ivory tipped with gold for awful kings. Moon and stars gazed in at them, wind sang to them lullaby, lumbering owls forbore to fly, not a bat flapped to and fro round their rest, cheek to cheek and breast to breast locked together in one nest. She's 41 and I'm 42. We were blue-eyed, little bright blonde-haired children. We were just always happy and playing, really. We slept in the same room. We Sometimes we chose to sleep in the same room. Even as older, like teenagers, we would always spend Christmas Eve in the same bed. <laughs> that sounds a bit sad, but... Um, yeah, so we, we were we were really close, but there was always a bit of rivalry. There's a strange relationship with siblings. I think she always felt like I was the good one and she was the bad one. And we fell into those roles and we never fell out of them, really. From teenage years, when she first started to have problems, by that point, like, we were vastly different. I mean, she, she would have been into dance music and I was into Nirvana you know there was like a it was almost like we couldn't be too more different if we tried which we probably did try I used to have a little job in a chemist and um I was walking to lunch one day and a police car came past I must have been 15 16 and in the back of the police car was my sister and so it's just this stark difference to our lives that I was going off to my little job in a chemist and she was being picked up by the police I think like alcohol is the, it's so easy to hide it because your dealer on the corner is the corner shop. Even the physical changes in your body aren't as noticeable straight away as if you were on a hard drug. So it, it, it takes long. I would say it's like 10 years before we really know the extent of her problem. And I think it, it was one Easter we were, I suppose, late 20s and we'd had a Sunday lunch and it was there was tension and my mum phoned me the next day because I'd, I'd left early and said, 
that her husband had cried and said, you don't understand, she needs to drink three cans of cider just to get up in the morning and life's so difficult. And I was at work at the time and I I just felt sick. I just, my, my stomach just dropped. So I, I, I run the drug and alcohol service and I arranged for an appointment and I went there straight after work and said, come on, we'll go and get help. We'll go and get you sorted. Um, she said that she was fine and that she was handling it. And from that point, everything came sort of crumbling down, really. Early in the morning when the first cock crowed his warning, neat like bees, as sweet and busy, Laura rose with Lizzie. Fetched in honey, milked the cows, aired and set to rights the house. Kneaded cakes of whitest wheat, cakes for dainty mouths to eat. Next churned butter, whipped up cream, fed their poultry, sat and sewed. Talked as modest maiden should. Lizzie with an open heart. Laura in an absent dream. One content. One sick, in part. One warbling for the mere bright day's delight. One longing for the night. We look similar, but she's always had dark hair, haven't we? Yeah, I think basically we were really sort of... Uh, we were similar in the sense that we were both really mad. So we were both really energetic, but... Um, I, I was the raver and she was the goth. Yeah. George always wanted to come with me everywhere, but I couldn't take her because I was, like, going to down-out places and I was just so scared to take her out and to do what I was doing because I knew it was wrong. So... I kept her away from them side of things, do you know what I mean? I started smoking weed at a very young age. And um, from weed, I, I ended up getting with the wrong sort of people all the time. My boyfriends were just just, just nightmares. And um, most of them were dealers. I used to take ecstasy, speed, ketamine, LSD. That's where it all started from. I can remember, like, you know... George would be in a room next door and I'd, 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 I'd be in the other room and with my partner taking ketamine. So that's where it all came from, really, wasn't it? Yeah. And it wasn't fair to her, so I was trying to hide the situation of what I was up to in my life when we were younger. Yeah, and I think that's the thing, isn't it? At some point, it became very apparent that, you know, you can't... Because I was quite young and naive, but then as you get older, you become more inquisitive. And I think eventually it was probably my fault that she got busted, you know. When I was quite young, um, when we when we were both living at home, and I think probably the first time really we realised what was going on, I'd gone into her bedroom, and when I'd walked into her bedroom, her partner was sat, like, kneeling with a spoon in his hand and a lighter... And, and and just that was like, I just watched my mum's face break, you know, and she just, that was it. And then, then from that moment, life really changed very quickly. Yeah. It was just the beginning of a really, really long, how many years? When I got into heroin and crack, that went on for 15 years. And during them 15 years of getting evicted and onto the streets, I spent five years on Mamba being on the streets because it was around me all the time, wherever I went. Like for virgin fruit, because heroin and crack and everything else that comes with it, it's just chaos. It's just, you, and it just ends in disaster. At length, slow evening came. They went with pictures to the reedy brook. Lizzie most placid in her look, Laura most like a leaping flame. They drew the gurgling water from its deep. Lizzie plucked purple and rich golden flags, then turning homeward said, The sunset flushes those furthest loftiest crags. Come, Laura, not another maiden lags. No willful squirrel wags. The beasts and birds are fast asleep. But Laura loitered, still among the rushes, and said, The, the bank, bank was steep, and said, The, the hour is was early, early still. still. The dew not fallen, the wind, the wind not, not chill. chill. Listening, ever, but not catching the customary cry. Come by, 
with its iterated jingle of sugar-baited words. Not for all her watching, once discerning even one goblin. Racing, whisking, tumbling, hobbling. Let alone the herds that used to tramp along the glen in groups or single of brisk fruit merchant men. Till Lizzie urged... Laura, come. I hear the fruit call, but I dare not look. You should not loiter longer at this brook. Come with me home. The stars rise... The moon bends her arc, each glowworm winks her spark. Let us get home before the night grows dark, for clouds may gather, though this is summer weather, put out the lights and drench us through. Then if we lost our way, what should we do? Laura turned cold as stone to find her sister heard that cry alone. That goblin cry, come buy our fruits, come buy. Must she then buy no more such dainty fruit? Must she no more such succors pasture find, gone deaf and blind? I can remember a point where I was in a white quilt by outside shoe zone in Wrexham and um, my sister drove past in a car with the kids and I can just remember seeing my sister's little one just looking at me in the car when I was, like, with a white quilt wrapped around me, yeah. thinking, oh, my God, do I wave? Don't I wave? What do I do? That, that's, a, that's a memory I'll always have in my head. And the same as her. I think that was, like, that touched her massively. It was like you both clocked each other. Yeah, and we there did, there was no yeah. hiding. There was no hiding. That was the safest place for me to sleep because there was a, I know there was lots of people going past, but at least I would have been found if anything had happened to me. I used to miss her more than anything. I didn't sleep for five years, six years, fully through the night. I literally didn't sleep. I used to just be... I'd go to sleep and wake up and then I'd just be thinking what you were doing and then I'd just toss and turn and I'd obsess. I guess, it's like, I watched her just drift away. Deteriorate. Deteriorate, yeah. And just and hide away. And lie, and it was... And it was really difficult, but I think that was... But beyond everything, the hardest thing I've ever had to deal with was the lies, was because we'd always been so close and we'd been so open, and then she had to lie to me to keep me safe. And, like, that was difficult. You wake up every morning, the first thing you want to do is go and score. Because initially, it's the first thought. But it's like the poisoned apple, and it is like a poisoned apple. I think, for me, seeing Sam on the streets was the most difficult... Um, and traumatic experience to witness. There were times that, you know, I saw people really taking advantage of her. You know, she'd be sort of in situations where she'd been beat up, left on the floor, and people, her purse was emptied, and God knows what else had happened to her. <clears throat> you can't imagine. And she used to help me, didn't you? Yeah. Her tree of life drooped from the root. She said not one word in her heart sore ache. But peering through the dimness, naught discerning, Laura! trudged home, her pitcher dripping all the way. Laura! So crept to bed and lay silent till Lizzie slept, <gasps> then sat up in a passionate yearning and gnashed her teeth for bulk desire and wept as if her heart would break. <laughs> Day after day, night after night, Laura kept watch in vain, in sullen silence of exceeding pain. She never caught again the goblin cry. Come by, come by. She never spied the goblin men hawking their fruits along the glen. But when the noon waxed bright, her hair grew thin and grey. She dwindled as the fair full moon does turn to swift decay and burn her fire away. It's lonely, really. It feels lonely. And to begin with, you know, the last few years, I felt like she might come back at some point. You're ploughing on and you keep digging away and, and that hope's still there. And what maybe one day you'll get her back. But I think the last... Three, four years, I've, it's just been a big realisation that she's not going to be my sister again. The minute that she starts to seem a little bit better, 
it's so painful when she goes back to being as bad again that I can't let myself fall into it. You feel, like, jealous when you see other sisters together. You feel sort of like this envy because I'm never going to have that. It's affected everything. It's affected every everything, every part of my life. Every day I think of her and wonder if, if she's going to be okay and always miss someone missing at the table. She's still missing from our table. She's still missing from from everything that we do. And it's like a grief. It's It's a living grief all the time. One day, remembering her kernel stone, she set it by a wall that faced the south, dewed it with tears, hoped for a root, watched for a waxing shoot. But there came none. It never saw the sun. It never felt the trickling moisture run. While with sunk eyes and faded mouth, she dreamt of melons. As a traveller sees false waves in desert drouth with shades of leaf-crowned trees and burns the thirstier in the sandful breeze. I feel guilty. I feel guilty all the time, actually, about a lot of things because I, th- I don't think that we showed her how wrong it was or how I think she was able to fool herself that she wasn't as bad as she was and we were complicit in that. Sometimes I think, why? What happened? What did I choose to do differently to what she chose to do? Or what, what's the difference in our experiences? And it's, it's hard in our situation because we are so close in age. It feels like I was the winner and she was the loser. She was very thin. She was always really quite house proud before and her house became a real mess and her hair was not done and it was quite knotted and alcohol makes you aggressive it makes you angry and it's it stops you being able to reason properly so it, she would fly off the handle at like really small things and so it got to the point where being in a company was just so uncomfortable that I just tried to avoid it but but you can't because it's your sister and Every time I saw her, I remember going home and just crying and thinking, gosh, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to help her. I would say that she's had addiction problems for 20 years towards the point of maybe getting to about 2010. She was probably drunk permanently, pretty much. I'd just become a caretaker, really, rather than... A sister, so we didn't go for lunch and meet up with the children, and we didn't we didn't do any of the things that sisters would normally do. I would routinely drive down to her house and just so that I could check on her. So it wasn't a sister. I wasn't popping in for a coffee. It wasn't a sisterly relationship. It was just trying to stop somebody killing themselves. Really, she no more swept the house, tended the fowls or cows. Fetched honey, kneaded cakes of wheat, brought water from the brook, but sat down listless in the chimney nook and would not eat. I was very much in survival mode and very much one track minded, just as she was. Her one track mindedness was the fruit, and mine is trying to destroy the fruit, right? I actually stayed with my sister, I think it was for just over a week. Even though we had hit bottoms before, I could tell that this was a different monster. And knowing how much she wasn't eating, I went to live with her for just over a week. And by the end of it, my first grey hairs sprouted. At the time, I didn't recognise her. And I was really struggling with getting through to her and understanding why it was that she felt that eating more than an apple and a coffee a day was so detrimental. But now now that I know that there are times when I'm speaking to the addiction, to the goblins, and not to her. I remember when my sister came to stay with me really, really well. 
I was just planning and planning. And I was like, the second she goes, I'm not going to see her. I'm going to push her out for months. And I remember planning all of it. Like, the second she leaves, I'm going to call my friends. They're going to bring everything. I'm going to pick up this. All of these things were so much more reassuring than real connection and real love and a hug. (laughs) So I remember that time very well. You went to rehab straight after. Was that straight after? Yeah, it was like two days after I left. Okay. Of course it was, yeah. So when I first got to rehab, the whole time I was thinking, all I need to do is just have a break for a few months and then I'll be fit again to go straight back into my addiction. And I just remember this incredible nurse coming up to me. She was like, you just think the whole world revolves around you. And I think that was the kind of light bulb moment of it tears everything apart. It affects everyone. And how can I amend that and make up for that and repay them for that? The guilt is on both sides because you constantly feel like, what is it that I didn't do that led to this being so tempting? What could have I done better? What could have I noticed earlier on? What could have I said? And obviously, at the end of the day, it is an illness and neither party is at fault. And so the guilt is misplaced on both sides of the table. I've had to work very hard to change my role. It's been very hard for me to say, no, you you can lean on your sister for X, Y and Z and you should be open. And there have been times when I've been going through a problem and I've had to literally force myself to be like, oh, My sister can help me with this. So talk to her about it. Call her up. So can it be very nice to get that equal relationship? Tender Lizzie could not bear to watch her sister's cankerous care, yet not to share. She night and morning caught the goblin's cry. Beside the brook, along the glen, she heard the tramp of goblin men, the yoke and stir poor Laura could not hear. Longed to buy fruit to comfort her, but feared to pay too dear. She thought of Jeannie in her grave, who should have been a bride, but who for joys brides hoped to have fell sick and died in her gay prime, in earliest winter time with the first glazing rhyme with the first snowfall of crisp winter time. In 2018, it was late 2018, Samantha went into detox and then into rehab. I had bad news when I went into detox and rehab about my friend when she died of an overdose. And, um, yeah, it was bad because she was my best friend and, yeah... I knew that if I didn't carry on doing what I was doing with detox and rehab, that I probably would have ended up the same way as her. Till Laura, dwindling, seemed knocking at death's door. Then Lizzie weighed no more, better and worse, but put a silver penny in her purse. Kissed Laura, crossed the heath with clumps of furs at twilight, halted by the brook and for the first time in her life, began to listen and look. (laughs) Laughed every goblin when they spied her peeping, came towards her hobbling, flying, running, leaping, puffing and blowing, chuckling, clapping, crowing, clucking and goblin, mopping and mowing, full of airs and graces, pulling wry faces, demure grimaces, cat-like, and rat-like, rattle and wombat-like, snail-paced in a hurry, parrot voice and whistler, helter-skelter, hurry-scurry, chattering like magpies, fluttering like pigeons, gliding like fishes. Hugged her and kissed her, squeezed and caressed her, stretched up their dishes, panniers and plates. Look at her, Torah, and done. Bob at our cherries, bite at our peaches, citrons and dates, grapes for the asking, 
Hey, it's red with bar skin Out in the sun Plums on their twigs Lock them and suck them Pomegranate sticks Lock them and suck them Pomegranate sticks When, when I saw her on the streets and she was out feeding food to me, I couldn't get over the fact that she was there and I was just so happy. I never really thought I couldn't help her. I just thought that maybe she would never change. I always knew that there was something I could do to make her life a little bit better, whether she wanted that or not. And I think it was, I never really gave up on the idea that, that she'd get better. I think there was always something inside of me that hoped, even though, you know, everybody... I could see it in everybody that they'd probably given up hope. I felt like I was the only person that was going to do anything really to change it. There was just something that was like, no, come on, there's one last try, like, we can do this. And we got through it, didn't we? And we got through and you smashed it. Good folk, said Lizzie, mindful of Jeannie. Give me much... And many. Held out her apron, tossed them her penny. Hey, take a seat with us. Honour and eat with us. They answered, grinning. Our feast is but beginning. Night yet is early, warm and dew pearly, wakeful and starry. Such fruits as these, no man can carry. Half their bloom would fly. Half their dew would dry. Half their flavour would pass by. Sit down and feast with us. Be welcome guests with us. Cheer you and rest with us. Thank you, said Lizzie. But one waits at home alone for me. So, without further parlaying, if you will not sell me any of your fruits, though much and many, give me back my silver penny I tossed you for a fee. They began to scratch their pates, no longer wagging, purring, but visibly demurring, grunting and snarling. One called her proud, cross-grained and civil. Their tones waxed loud, their looks were evil. Lashing their tails, they trod and hustled her, elbowed and jostled her, clawed with their nails, barking, mewing, hissing, mocking, tore her gown and soiled her stocking, twitched her hair out by the roots, stamped upon her tender feet, held her hands and squeezed their fruits against her mouth to make her eat. White and golden Lizzie stood, like a lily in a flood, like a rock of blue-veined stone lashed by tides obstreperously, like a beacon left alone in a hoary, roaring sea, sending up a golden fire, like a fruit-crowned orange tree white with blossoms honey-sweet, sore beset by wasp and bee, like a royal virgin town topped with gilded dome and spire, close beleaguered by a fleet mad to tug her standard down. One may lead a horse to water, twenty cannot make him drink, though the goblins cuffed and caught her, coaxed and fought her, bullied and besought her, scratched her, pinched her black as ink, kicked and knocked her, mauled and mocked her, Lizzie uttered not a word, would not open lip from lip, lest they should cram a mouthful in, but laughed in heart to feel the drip of juice that syruped all her face and lodged in dimples of her chin and streaked her neck, which quaked like curd. At last, the evil people, worn out by her resistance, flung back her penny, kicked their fruit along whichever road they took, not leaving root or stone or shoot. Some rised into the ground, some dived into the brook with ring and ripple. Some scudded on the gale without a sound. Some vanished in the distance. In a smart ache, tingle, Lizzie went her way. Knew not, was it night or day? Sprang up the bank, tore through the firs, threaded copse and dingle, and heard her penny jingle bouncing in her purse. Its bounce was music to her ear. 
She ran and ran, as if she feared some goblin man dogged her with jibe or curse or something worse. But not one goblin scurried after. Nor was she pricked by fear. The kind heart made her windy paste that urged her home quite out of breath with haste and inward laughter. She cried Laura, up the garden. Did you miss me? Come and kiss me. Never mind my bruises. Hug me. Kiss me. Suck my juices. Squeeze from goblin fruits for you. Goblin pulp and goblin dew. Eat me. Drink me. Love me, Laura. Make much of me. For your sake I have braved the glen and had to do with goblin merchant men. Laura started from her chair, flung her arms up in the air, clutched her hair. Lizzie, Lizzie, have you tasted for my sake the fruit forbidden? Must your light like mine be hidden? Your young life like mine be wasted? Undone in mine undoing, and ruined in my ruin. Thirsty, cankered, goblin-ridden. She clung about her sister, kissed and kissed and kissed her. Tears once again refreshed her shrunken eyes, dropping like rain after long sultry drought. Shaking with aguish fear and pain, she kissed and kissed her with a hungry mouth. Her lips began to scorch. That juice was wormwood to her tongue. She loathed the feast. Writhing as one possessed, she leapt and sung, rent all her robe, and wrung her hands in lamentable haste and beat her breast. Her look streamed like the torch borne by a racer at full speed, or like the mane of horses in their flight, or like an eagle when she stems the light straight toward the sun, or like a caged thing freed, or like a flying flag when armies run. It's the most frustrating situation to be in, to see somebody that you love that dearly and that you can't imagine life without acting in a way that is going to to kill them. She knew that to live the rest of her life, she would require a liver transplant and that she would have to be sober for a prolonged period of time to even qualify to be on a, a list for a donor. She would not be able to be sober for that period of time. We were told as a family that she was terminally ill probably two to three years before she passed away. But I, I still don't think she accepted the her you know her the reality and her fate that I don't think she ever believed that that this would kill her swift fire spread through her veins knocked at her heart met the fire smoldering there and overbore its lesser flame she gorged on bitterness without a name Ah, oh, fool, to choose such part of soul-consuming care. Sense failed in the mortal strife, like the watchtower of a town which an earthquake shatters down, like a lightning-stricken mast, like a wind-uprooted tree spun about, like a foam-topped water spout cast down headlong in the sea, she fell at last. Pleasure passed and anguish passed, is it death or is it life? We ended up, she saved up a little bit of money and uh, put six months m of her own money down on a deposit for a house. And now we've got this new relationship where there's no lies, no shame. I wouldn't have been able to do it without my sister. And I would have been in a coffin. But it's really difficult because, because I hurt her in some way. What do you mean that with because of what I've done, like by, by my the way yeah. I the path I took in life. And do you know what I'll tell you that is? I always say like I've hurt you. Yeah, shall I tell you what that is? That's you and your own thoughts. That's like you've put a mirror into you. Yeah, but it's listen. like you saying that you didn't sleep. Um, yeah, but you listen. I promise you. I, I pinky promise you because there's no shame attached. There's a new life out there for me. 
And you. Both of us. She's my soulmate. Come here. <laughs> Life out of death. That night long, Lizzie watched by her, counted oh. her pulses flagging stir, felt for her breath, held water to her lips, and cooled her face with tears and fanning leaves. But when the first birds chirped about their eaves, and early reapers plodded to the place of golden sheaves, and dew-wet grass bowed in the morning winds, so brisk to pass, and new buds with new day opened of cut like lilies on the stream, Laura awoke as from a dream, <laughs> laughed in the innocent old way, hugged Lizzie, but not twice or thrice. Her gleaming locks showed not one thread of grey. Her breath was sweet as May, and light danced in her eyes. I'm so grateful for the relationship that we have because I feel like it is a lot more level. Our relationship is priceless. I do feel like we're sisters now. It's the greatest gift that recovery has given me, for sure. The addiction just grows and grows and it takes over everything. Hope is even worse than the anger and the guilt. If every day when I think about her, I hope that she'd get better, it would be harder. And it's also harder because you know that she has got, she has had times where she's got better. And the aftermath of that, when, when she started drinking really badly again, is almost worse. Nothing good has come from the hope so far. I would love to be able to sit around a table with all our children together and have a sisterly Sunday lunch or a, or a meal out and to say, oh, remember when it was so bad and it's, a, and it's a painful memory, but it's just a memory. I would love to be able to do that. That's not the reality. The addiction is too strong. Days, weeks, months, years afterwards, when both were wives with children of their own, their mother hearts beset with fears, their lives bound up in tender lives. Laura would call the little ones and tell them of her early prime, those pleasant days long gone of not returning time. Would talk about the haunted glen, glen. the wicked, quaint, fruit, fruit merchant, merchant men, men, their fruits like, like honey, honey to, to the, the throat, throat, but poison, poison in the blood. In the blood. Men sell, Men sell not, not such, such in, in any town. town. Would tell them how her sister, sister stood, stood in, deadly, in peril deadly peril to do to her do good, good and win, win the fiery, fiery antidote. antidote. Then joining hands to little hands would bid them cling together. For oh, there is no friend like, like a sister, sister in calm or stormy weather. weather. To cheer, to cheer one, one on the tedious way, way. To, to fetch one if one goes astray, to lift one if one totters down, to strengthen whilst one stands. It was three years ago in February that Karis passed away. Her heart gave way. The pressure that was being placed on her organs and her liver was so badly damaged that she passed away in her sleep in the end because her heart just stopped. It was hard to accept that alcohol could take her and could do this damage to somebody so young. She had such a rapid decline. She Alcohol killed Karis within seven to eight years. But I think the toughest thing to get my head around is the stigma. We were faced with the fact that we were going to lose our loved one. She was terminally ill and we had to stand by and watch her deteriorate and to not feel that you can share that with other people because of the risk of somebody saying, well, they've brought it on themselves. I know that once she passed, people said to me, and not just one person, a few people, well, it must be a relief, which you know, it was almost like somebody slapping me across the face saying that because if I had to do it all over again, I would for her. I didn't have what people would call a normal 20s. But if somebody gave me the choice and I could have her back and go through that in my 30s, 40s, 50s for the rest of my life, that that 
that would be easy. I would take that decision because I've never had a life without her. My life has always been with her. When I was brought home from hospital, I was put in a cot next to her. The first time I ever had my own bedroom was when I was 19 and went to university. Trying to, to live without that part of me is very, very tough. So it, it's certainly not a relief to not be with her. It would be a relief to have her back and to go through it again. In Goblin Market, the real stories were collected in conversation with Georgia Cat. Christina was played by Ellie Piercy, Laura by Kathleen Cranham, and Lizzie by Anjana Vassen. The goblins were played by Ed Gocken, Joel McCormack, and Chris Lucam Hoy. And the children were Eliza and Orla Pierce. The singers were Stephen Jeffs, Tom Raskin, and Edward Price. Produced by Jonathan Manners. The composer was James Maloney, and sound was by Peter Ringrose. The programme was adapted from the poem by Christina Rossetti and directed by Jessica Dromgoole.